Hello. Um, it's true, actually, I'd kind of forgotten nine years ago. Uh, I went to bar camp and heard Danny uh, uh, talking about something I was really interested in and thought, God, this would be great if it happened more often. And, uh, yeah, and so set up a, I can't remember what it was now, some kind of WordPress thing or something. And then something else happened. And then before you knew it, uh, we were meeting up regularly and learning lots of stuff about UX from people uh, kind of across the board from lots of different companies. Uh, and actually thinking about it, that's uh, sort of fairly fundamental to what I believe in, which is um, uh, not working in small silos, not just being competitive uh, within one team or one company, but actually sharing knowledge and becoming w what you could call a, a community of practice. So, um, so thank you for letting me be here today and part of this community of practice. Um, so I've actually um, I changed the title of my talk. Um, and then ended up writing a whole new talk. So this is completely new, uh, and you'll have to forgive me if I kind of get a bit lost or whatever. But um, I started thinking originally about um, uh, w what you should do if you, ha if you, if you really hate your work, <laughs> if you're stuck in a job, that sort of thing. And that went down quite a negative route. So <laughs> I thought, actually, how can I, how can I reframe it in a bit more of a kind of positive light? And so, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is, um, is, is, is work, um, because we're all engaged in some kind of work. Uh, but thinking about how the world of work is changing, uh, what's making it change, um, uh, what this might mean for, for designers. Uh, and I'm kind of purposely using design instead of UX design, uh, which I'll kind of come on to later. But um, I kind of uh, think there's time for a bit of a reframing about the kind of labels. Uh, and then what we might do about it, um, using some of my sort of experiences as a bit of an illustration. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I think it's going to be 20 minutes, but... It's a new talk. Who knows? <laughs> when I get nervous as well, I get really, really talking fast, so it might be over in 10 minutes, in which case you'd have a coffee. Um, but before we do anything, uh, I would like you... Uh, I'm kind of hoping everyone's got a pen and paper. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I'd like you to turn to the person next to you, and I would like you to draw each other. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds, so which really isn't very long, so you need to get your pens and paper out now. Uh, so... And draw it as well as you can, but as fast as you can, and I'll time it. That actually took me so long to get my uh, phone out, you've actually got a bit more time. We've got 10 seconds left. I can see some people haven't even got their pens out of the bags yet. I should have warned you. Job done. 30 seconds over. So now show each other your drawings. <laughs> Hopefully there's a few apologies being made. And then... Uh, Take a picture of it and tweet it to that hashtag. So, so why did I get you to draw each other? Apart from the fact it's quite nice to kind of uh, have you do something rather than me. But uh, I think it's always worth remi uh, remembering uh, that we're all just uh, human, we're all just people, and that everyone is full of the same sort of frailties, hopes, dreams, needs and wants. And, uh, and that actually by looking at each other, uh, and uh, having a little laugh, then that can actually help us connect with each other. And the more that we can connect with each other, the more we can trust each other, and that makes us feel happier and safer, and like we belong to something. Uh, and hopefully, that's one of the reasons why we come to things like this, so that we can connect to other people. So that was kind of a little aside. Um, who's familiar with this acronym? Put your hand up if you know it. God, there's a one. Okay, so I will explain what it means then. Uh, so... This acronym stands for volatile, oops, a daisy, not that one. Uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, and it's an acronym that uh, was born out of the American military uh, in their response to the kind of new conditions of warfare that they were facing post the Cold War, uh, particularly 
as they started to experience uh, new and different kinds of terrorism. And, uh, and you can kind of, uh, hopefully, I, I, I think, maybe connect to these words in, in terms of what's going on around us at the moment. Um, so what kind of world we live in. It's, uh, it's different, it's changing, it's changing faster and faster. The world has always changed, obviously, but the rate of change is, uh, is, is, is increasing. And so this uh, acronym's actually been adopted by the business community because um, it kind of helps to explain or to, to categorise some of the sort of chaotic turbulence that's happening around us and is impacting on the kind of business environment that um, most of us kind of work in or are affected by as customers, or consumers or service uh, users. Um, and you've only got to look at all the newspapers or the, you know, listen to the, the radio and the news that's going on to kind of understand that actually um, there's a lot of things going on at the moment which are um, very difficult to categorise, very difficult to, um, uh, to understand from a past point of view. And so... Um, there's a need for us to start to, um, to operate differently and kind of more comfortably in more uncertain terms, times even. And that um, is, is kind of uh, impacting the, the organisations that service, uh, either provide us with, uh, with things or services, but the kind of institutions, organisations, businesses that are all around us are um, uh, finding it harder and harder to operate in the way that they used to uh, to operate. And that's because, particularly because of technology, everything around us is moving so fast that actually the structures that were built out of, uh, in the past are no longer kind of fit for purpose for this sort of environment. And so, if technology is forcing change on all of our institutions, then um, big old corporates in particular and big old, um, I always think about public service like councils and things like that, um, also are, are stretched um, because the way they're structured doesn't really fit. And so the kind of more successful companies are learning that they need to network their organisations um, in order to stay competitive in an environment where we see a lot more kind of nimble startups. So uh, startups that actually are born out of a kind of digital mindset. And so the organisations that will survive and thrive are those that are organised for adaptability. And I think those that are digital by default. Um, a bit thirsty, going to have a little drink. So in the past, most of our organisations, or the ones that have survived for a long time, have actually been optimised for efficiency. And that's kind of built or predicated on a kind of predictability of the world that they operate in. And so, if the world is unpredictable, how do organisations need to change in order to fit that unpredictability? And so, this is a, a set of conditions that are kind of proposed by uh, the Responsive Org um, sort of grouping. It's uh, people who are interested in uh, new ways of working, new ways of organising, and they've written a manifesto. Everyone writes a manifesto nowadays, but, um, but it's a good one. And, um, and so they're looking at how can future fit organisations um, be built to kind of learn and respond more rapidly, um, given there's a kind of open flow of information around them. Uh, how can they encourage experimenting, uh, experimentation and kind of learning on really rapid cycles? And how can you organise as a network? Um, so in that network might be people within and without the organisation. So how can you create organisations that are more porous and more flexible and can come together and work on certain things and then go away again? I'm almost like a shoal idea. And, uh, and actually, how can, we, um, how can we move away from the thought that, business, uh, that the purpose of business is actually to make a profit, when actually we know that making money isn't necessarily the thing that gets us all fired up. Yes, we want money to some degree, but actually the thing that really gets us going is not really money. It's something other than that, and I'll come on to talk about that kind of more clearly. So the thing that motivates most people is some sense of a shared goal, of a shared purpose. And so uh, a kind of future-fit organisation puts that at the heart, and profit is incidental. Necessary, but a byproduct, not the, the real point. So this can be characterised as a kind of like a new normal. It's not going, we're not going to go back to an old uh, sort of framing of, um, oh yeah, all this kind of volatility, it's all going to calm down, it's all going to stop, and we're going to get back to how we were. It's not going to happen. So this is the new normal. 
And so if this is the new normal, how do we need to change? And um, especially if you look at how, uh, how the internet has kind of challenged and overcome um, business models, for instance, from shopping to shipping, you know, everything is changed um, by the connectivity uh, provided by the internet. And, and that's enabled different agile competitors to emerge. So much smaller businesses, there's a much lower cost of startup now. Um, you can compete in very different ways from a very small base. And that, those kind of agile competitors tend to have flexible, distributed and engaged workforces. So that kind of gives them advantage um, over the kind of um, the sort of incumbents, which wasn't necessarily the case in the past. And so you could also say that, um, on a kind of in a positive way, that the internet has uh, has introduced a kind of new ethos, a new ethos uh, based on community, trust, hyperconnectivity. Um, we can look at open source software. We can look at crowdfunding. Uh, we can cr look at new businesses that are being created that create platforms for other things to happen. And so. That's a massively positive force, as well as a disruptive force. And um, the, the kind of uh, the new framing of how we can organise and how we can do business better is to capitalise on the positive stuff that the internet gives us, um, as well as accommodating some of the less positive. And so we could see that we've seen a revolution in technology. Uh, it's become more intelligent, more adaptive, more scalable. Um, and that really we need to demand the same of our organisations. They need to fit with that new world. And uh, so if, if we're looking at organisations and we're looking at the world in which those organisations exist, then uh, what about us and, and work? So uh, organisations are just groupings of people coming together to get some stuff done. That's work. The paradigm of work is, uh, has kind of evolved over time. So from uh, the era where you just did what you were born into uh, to the industrialised era. And uh, if we look at the, in, uh, the sort of industrial model, a lot of us are still working in org organisations that are kind of pre predicated on that construct, where we bring together people um, into uh, urban environments, uh, the kind of growth of cities is well known, so the, the, the idea is that most of us will be living in urban environments um, kind of before too long. Uh, and then uh, and that, that work is, uh, is really a transaction. So you turn up, you get paid for your time, for your labour, and then that enables you to pay for your life. And so each of those uh, people working in that environment are kind of almost like cogs in the machine. Uh, and a, each of those people are then... Uh, interchangeable, replaceable. Um, the whole machine is optimised for efficiency. Uh, they sort of define what the output is and they try and use fewer and fewer resources uh, so that they can operate at lower and lower costs. But if we're not living in that kind of economy anymore and we're not using those kind of industrial era principles um, and that's all over, then what's new? So... How should we be working? How will we be working in the future? What kind of people uh, do these new kind of organisations need? What kind of future uh, is... What's the, what does the future need from workers? And, uh, and so uh, I was trying to find a word. Peasant was easy, worker was easy. And then I was trying to think, well, what's the word for this new kind of worker? And, uh, and so uh, I came up with free agent. And, um, and I think it kind of um, it suggests uh, an, an, era, uh, an era where actually what we're being paid to do is to bring our creativity, to bring our ideas, and to bring much more than just our hands to work. So the way that we can create uh, value uh, for our employers or for ourselves is uh, through our creativity, our, our ability to innovate and solve problems, and our responsiveness, our personal responsiveness, responsiveness to changing conditions. So, who here is familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Loads of people. So, um, I know it's discredited in lots of different ways, but it's still a really good framing, I think, for uh, lots of different things. So, I'm going to use it anyway. Um, uh, 
What about employee engagement? Who here is uh, familiar with employee engagement and what that means? Yeah, some people. Uh, so there's a whole f new sort of uh, body of work around employee engagement. So uh, the degree to which people who are working in a business are actually engaged in the work that they're doing, how much they care, um, how much um, uh, they value that work, and how much of themselves they can bring to that work. And so employee engagement is uh, within the kind of HR, learning and development uh, sort of realm. It's a really, really big thing. And um, Nick Marks, who's going to talk later, uh, he, he sometimes refers to it um, and talks more about happiness. So hopefully we'll hear a bit more about it later. But um, if we say that uh, an organisation's got a job to do to, um, to fit into this new realm that I've just described, uh, they need to move from the industrial model uh, of kind of cogs in the machine uh, to one that enables people, the people who work in that business, to bring not just their hands, but their brains, their heart, their soul to their work. And so um, uh, Maslow argued that, uh, that individuals uh, have to satisfy their kind of basic needs, like warmth, safety, and security. Uh, and then uh, in order to get to a point where actually they can start to focus on their personal growth and development. And uh, this kind of model suggests that, um, that the same theory can be applied to how an organisation uh, treats and engages with their employees. And so... Uh, those organisations that can understand how to fully meet people's needs can benefit all round. So those businesses that actually have an engaged um, uh, body of people working with them, uh, they have higher productivity, uh, they are more profitable. Uh, people tend to stay in jobs that they like, so, uh, so they have much higher retention rates of staff, which means that they've got lower recruitment costs. Uh, there are lower levels of sickness and stress because, not surprisingly, if people don't really like their work, they get really stressed. They don't, f they don't feel happy and they don't feel uh, well. And so uh, you also see things like higher rates of, um, uh, of, of workplace accidents in, in companies that have less engaged employees. And so in this sort of kind of model, then, um, what we're looking at is, is uh, if people are just turning up to get paid and that's all they really care about, then uh, that's the kind of like the base level. And what we're trying to do is trying to get to a point where actually the work that we do is the way of kind of uh, finding uh, fulfillment, of fulfilling your sort of sense of self and getting to the point where actually work helps you achieve your full potential. And this is why it's kind of important. <laughs> so um, not just from a personal perspective, like for the individual, but uh, there's a, a massive productivity gap so uh, the UK uh, is lagging behind the other G7 nations. Uh, apart from Japan, we beat Japan, so thank you. Um, but uh, in effect, <laughs> it takes us uh, five days to produce what workers in the USA, Canada, France, Germany and Italy can all produce in four days. And there's no reason for it. But there's also studies that are showing that um, actually levels of employee engagement in the UK... Uh, are kind of scarily low. So those, uh, that, that kind of figure of 30% of employees feel that they're actively engaged with their work means that there's 70% 70, 70 of people who aren't. Uh, and those people uh, are almost losing an opportunity. And business is losing an opportunity, and the country is losing an opportunity. So it's kind of, uh, it feels like there's a job to be done. And there's, a, you know, there's no causal link between this not one that's been proved, but you can certainly correlate the two. And then there's more challenges on the horizon for the world of work. And so uh, there's loads of these kind of reports banging around, uh, sort of hanging around at the moment, but that um, advances in technology are going to cost human jobs. Uh, and uh, it seems fairly obvious, really. Uh, that uh, if machines are capable of doing almost any of the work that humans can do, what will we do? What will humans do? And so this report, uh, the World Economic Forum, Forum's uh, report, estimates that 7.1 million jobs could be lost through redundancy, automation, or disintermediation. But they're also saying that 2.1 million new jobs could be created. So it's not all bleak news. So if job losses can be offset by employment growth in other areas, what are those other areas? And how will we know? Like, where should we be looking 
for work? What kind of jobs should we be creating? And um, I went to a Future Fest, a Nesta conference last year, and this was the most interesting talk. Um, certainly the one I tweeted about most. But uh, it's basically um, a really heavy-duty research report, um, but looking at what are the jobs most at risk of automation. And uh, it's very easy to think, um, uh, when we think about automation, to think about robots replacing uh, factory floor workers, for instance. But uh, obviously, algorithms count as automation too. And, uh, and those algorithms can replace much more kind of uh, middle class jobs. Uh, and so we can apply it to, uh, so for instance, accountants or financial advisors or estate agents or lawyers. All of those jobs have a risk of automation too because they're based on applying rules. So uh, there are sort of fundamental rules that underpin quite a lot of jobs. And, uh, and if they can be applied algorithmically, they will. And so these slides, um, uh, they're terrible pictures, and I apologize for that. I couldn't actually find the presentation online, which would have been good. Um, but uh, the kind of really, really um, uh, heartening thing, hopefully for the people in this room, is that creative occupations are less likely to be automated. So uh, the kind of findings of this report is that uh, the jobs that are harder to replace are those that, that rely most on human traits. So creativity, the ability to invent new stuff, uh, in the face of problems. So um, hopefully you would count yourselves within the creative class. And empathy. So the ability to actually uh, understand uh, another's point of view, another's life, uh, and to uh, accommodate that within a solution. So in this, uh, this slide here, in orange you can see the ones that are most at risk. So umpires and referees, so uh, your toast. Um, Tax preparers, I'm not quite sure what a tax preparer is. It doesn't sound like a job I'd like to do. But <laughs> interestingly, uh, uh, slaughterers, not, not much risk of automation there. Um, uh, economists, they're OK. Uh, clergy, so <laughs> can't automate a, a priest. Uh, and choreographers. So uh, they're basically looking at a whole list of different kinds of jobs and then categorizing them using some very clever stuff that I didn't quite understand from the report. But um, it's all online if you want to um, uh, unpick it. But um, I think what, what became interesting then is, well, OK, these jobs that are going to be automated or could well be automated, what, what are they going to be replaced by? And what does that mean? So does it mean that human work uh, will become kind of more highly valued? So uh, will nurses start to be more valued than bankers, for instance? Um, who knows? I'd like that to be the case. So um, in this final tweet, this, uh, this, this um, slide here, the, the showing suggestions, suggestions for the kind of jobs uh, that we should be created um, and sort of designing uh, the, sort of the, the job that might uh, help us install new forms of energy. So wind energy engineers, solar energy installation managers, nanotechnology engineers, and here, informatics nurse specialists, which, um, again, is kind of like melding some kind of technical approach, but uh, uh, with a kind of caring profession. So I can only hope that someone somewhere is joining the dots and updating the education system so that we're actually developing cohorts of children that are going to develop the right skills that will help them operate in this uh, system as opposed to the sad orange system over here. Um, I, I don't hold out much hope, to be honest, but it would be good if we started thinking about that and started thinking about how we redesign the education system to get the workforce that we need. Um, anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> a few years ago, uh, I was doing that thing where you kind of look in the mirror, cleaning your teeth, uh, and your brain's kind of noodling in the background, uh, and I ended up adding up the number of days that I'd been alive. <laughs> And uh, it was 16,000-ish. Uh, and it, I was thinking, God, that's a really big number. Uh, and I kind of started to wonder what I'd been doing with it all. <laughs> uh, but then, on a kind of more positive note, it kind of occurred to me that, um, all being well, fingers crossed, uh, I might well have another 16,000 days left. Uh, and then I started thinking, well, what am I going to do with them? <laughs> uh, and how will, I make, how will I make them count? There's something about... Um, 
thinking about your lifespan, I think, that helps put some stuff in context. And uh, I was sort of talking to a good friend about this, and he gave me this book. And uh, I totally, totally recommend reading it, um, especially if any of you here are also having any kind of 16,000 days sort of moment. Um, but Because uh, it's really important that we don't just think about uh, jobs, um, but about how a life can be well lived. Um, and a sense that the time that we've spent putting into the work, because it does take up the majority of our time, how we can feel that that's been well spent. And so, uh, it was interesting actually to see Richard use the, um, uh, the sort of damn pink stuff. Uh, he had the exciting video, so I'm sorry, I've just got a slide. But um, uh, in thinking about motivation, which is, so Dan Pink's uh, book Drive has got it all in there, but to be honest, the RSA talk is uh, much quicker to digest. Um, but it's talking about money uh, being on the table for all of us. Uh, so when we think about work, we often think that we work because we need to, we get paid, and that's why we do the work that we do. But actually, it's not really, is it? Like, you don't do the work that, that you do just to get paid. Um, but money is important. So in this sort of, uh, uh, sort of quote, then Dan Pink's saying that um, you have to pay people enough so that it's not an issue. And, uh, and so you kind of take that off the table so people aren't thinking about it. And instead, then you uh, focus on autonomy, mastery and purpose as being the things that really get people going, that really get the most out of people. Um, and so I think it's worth talking about money. Uh, so when we're thinking about work, we have to think about money. Um, but money is really weird, because it doesn't really exist. Like, uh, it's not anything. It's a promise to pay <coughs> someone to something. Apparently, the money doesn't even really belong to us. I don't know. Um, and banks can just create new money whenever they want to. Um, so if it doesn't really exist, and it's not really a thing, it does dictate behavior. So uh, it makes us do things. So we might like to think that we work to get paid, um, but we don't really. It's part of the package. Um, but then once you get past your basic needs being met, then it's not really the thing that motivates us. So in the research work that went into Drive, um, uh, they did a whole load of experiments, and they found that incentivizing tasks uh, that require any kind of, um, even a small amount of, uh, of cognitive skill, uh, if you incentivize that with money, it actually leads to worse performance. So, um, and also uh, research shows that uh, people forget the sort of rosy glow of a pay rise after about two weeks. So that, <laughs> it doesn't last. Um, and the actual amount that you get paid is much less important to people than how it compares to the people around them, to their peers. And so there's something weird going on. Um, and it's worth thinking about our own relationship with money um, when we're trying to think about the work that we want to do and why we're doing the jobs that we're doing. Um, if we look at the kind of autonomy, mastery, and purpose blobs, then those things are the things that, are really matter, that, that really matter to us. And they're much higher aligned to the top of that pyramid, the Maslow's pyramid, the, the idea of fulfillment, of finding uh, the... The, the thing that will actually help you feel like you have spent your, your life well. Um, and so autonomy is uh, the kind of ability to direct your own life, to make your own choices. Um, and mastery, obviously, is the sense of getting better at something that really matters, that, that's important to us. Um, and then purpose. Purpose is... It can be a bit more confusing because it feels like kind of, oh, purpose, meaning. Um, but it's the feeling that we're doing something that's contributing to something greater than ourselves, um, so that we're adding something back. So if we relate this back to, to thinking about, well, we need to create new jobs, then the kind of new jobs that we need to create are jobs that use the skills that humans have and machines lack. So um, at the moment, God only knows where they're going to go, but uh, creativity and empathy. We need jobs that will motivate people to do their best work. Um, so we need jobs with purpose. And we need the organisations that are designed to enable people to do their best work. Because very often, it's organisations that get in the way of, uh, of people's best abilities. So, luckily, uh, <laughs> there's some quite big things that, uh, that designers could get their teeth into. Um, and so I say designer. I, I am a designer. Um, it's taken me a long time to sort of claim that. I'm a designer. 
Because when people ask what you do and you say you're a designer, they think you colour things in. Um, uh, and I don't actually think about it like that. I think it's a mindset. So uh, I think it's a, it's a way of operating in the world as much as a job title. And that's how I claim it. Um, and so it's my way of approaching the world. So whatever work I'm going to do or that I do do, I approach it as a designer. And so um, a, a kind of belief that I have is that my skills are kind of accreted with experience, like kind of barnacles on a rock. And, uh, and that I can apply those skills uh, to any problem. So I don't want to be limited to, oh, I'm this kind of designer or that kind of designer. I'm a designer and I can apply things, uh, my skills, to anything that really interests me. Um, so I'm not going to limit myself um, with a job title. Um, but I will follow my interest. And most of my interest at the moment is, uh, is kind of regenerating towns. But um, <laughs> going back to those big sort of problems, um, uh, you might look at those problems of the world and think, well, that's governments. Governments have to solve all that. I can say they're not really doing that good a job. Uh, and so um, there, are, there is a role uh, for people who are starting businesses, for people who are running businesses, to start to address some of those bigger problems. And uh, I know sort of it's traditional to quote Steve Jobs, but I think we should move on to Elon Musk. Uh, so uh, so he, he should be our new Steve Jobs and should be quoted in every design-related conference ever. Um, but uh, he's an entrepreneur who's not focusing on money. He's focusing on some really massive problems. And I find that really, really interesting, particularly because he states it really clearly in every interview. He talks about purpose before he talks about profit. And, uh, and I think that uh, that creates a kind of, almost like a role model. But what he's demonstrating is that an, an entrepreneur can see that a really good solution to a really big problem actually uh, creates um, or gives access to a massive market. So if you could start solving some of these uh, things like, uh, you know, he's talking about uh, sustainable transport. Um, he's talking about a sustainable energy system. So if he can solve that to some degree, he can make shitloads of money out of that and do something good. So uh, I kind of think that that's, uh, that's an interesting model. Um, and it's not all about altruism or, you know, people like the Gates Foundation make loads of money uh, and then sort of decide who you give it to. It's, it's a very different way of framing business. And so I'm also interested that he's taking a kind of systemic approach. He's not saying, well, I'm going to stick to cars. He's looking at the whole system. And in doing that, he's opening doors into whole other business sectors. And he's not limited by the fact that he doesn't really know it. He's a tech entrepreneur. But then suddenly, you know, he's in the car business. He's in the energy um, sort of generation business. He's in the storage business. You can't think, well, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. He hasn't let there be a limit around what he can and can't do. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there's also space travel. Let's bung some of that in as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he's, he's working on serving a higher purpose. Um, and he's been really clear about it. But it's not solely altruistic, because he's also making a lot of money. So we don't have to kind of totally throw away the fact that business is here to make money we can say, oh, look, actually, if you serve a higher purpose, if you focus on really big problems, actually, profit can come as a byproduct. So, uh, how to find your purpose. It's a kind of, uh, I find it a little bit intimidating to talk about purpose, because it feels sort of like big, um, uh, and maybe a bit fluffy or something like that. But, uh, also, it's difficult if you don't really know what your purpose is. You kind of like stride through the world saying, I'm this, this is my purpose. And so uh, does it mean that you have no purpose? And then that's a terrible judgment to make on yourself. So anyway, I've kind of come to the conclusion that it's fine to explore. And, uh, and you don't have to really know and you don't have to really state. What you have to do is to be clear that you're on a journey towards something, even though you don't really know where you're going to end up. So... Uh, a number of years ago, I was on a board away day, which in itself are kind of uh, usually fairly frightful things. But uh, we were kind of tasked to, um, to, to work our way through this kind of audio book, which was a kind of find your purpose sort of audio book. And then we were supposed to come to the away day and be able to sort of share our results. 
Uh, and I'd gone through this audio book, and I kind of, uh, I just I couldn't, I couldn't reach anything, couldn't get to anything. We sat around the table, and one by one, my colleagues were going, I'm this, I'm here to do that. And, uh, and I was thinking, shit, shit, it's my turn. And then as soon as it got to my turn, it's like I burst into tears. And I, I don't know what my purpose is. And, uh, and, and it was fairly awful. Uh, but at the moment, uh, at the time, I had really young kids, and, and what I couldn't really um, sort out uh, was um, how my purpose uh, kind of excluded them. Um, so I kind of felt that almost uh, my purpose at the time was, was to be a parent. Uh, and as a good feminist, that was quite distressing. <laughs> it was like, oh shit, I'm just a mother. But <laughs> obviously that's an important role, blah, blah. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> over time, stuff changes. And, uh, and so I kind of, I, f I feel like I've been sort of working my way along that journey and I don't cry about it anymore, so that's all right. Um, oops, so Daisy, I think I skipped one. Did I? Oh, no, that's right. So, um, this, yeah, this is stuff that um, y you can start actually kind of working where you're sort of through your categories and you can kind of look at what you're doing and saying, well, uh, you know, can I, s can I see um, outcomes from what I'm doing? And, you know, so collective purpose, am I working together and part of a whole, you know, something, something bigger than myself? Social purpose, am I having a wider impact? You can do that and it's quite a sort of logical process. Um, uh, but I haven't done that. So what I've done is, uh, is, is I, I kind of invented this <laughs> um, sort of little test for myself. So, um, and it's one I can share with you. Uh, so if I feel like I'm kind of going off track and I'm thinking I don't really know what I'm doing, then I just uh, work my way through this. And, uh, and if I answer no to any of these, then you say no to the project. And if you're working in a job, then you get a new job. Because if you don't give a shit about these things, you shouldn't really be doing it. It's a waste of your time. So uh, there's a guy called Alex Keroff, uh, who's been a meaning speaker uh, a couple of times. He's the chief happiness officer um, at a company called Woohoo Inc. Uh, and, uh, and he makes you say it like that as well. You can't go woohoo. It has to be woohoo. Uh, it's a Danish consultancy. Um, he's, if ever you see him speak, he's, he's brilliant. He's really funny um, and sort of quite compelling. But um, he started uh, International Quit Your Crappy Job Day. Uh, it's on March the 31st every year, uh, and he says he started it because too many people stay for too long in jobs they hate. So uh, I don't know where this figure comes from, but he says an estimated 20 to 25 percent of employees hate their jobs and wish they could quit tomorrow. Uh, and he says it's bad for you. <sighs> it's bad for you to be constantly going to work in something you hate. So being unhappy at work destroys your career, your health, your family, and your private life. So uh, he says quitting is an option and often it's the best option. So if you can answer no uh, to any of those questions about the work you're currently doing, uh, go to that website and, uh, and have a little look. But, um, uh, and apply it to any projects that come your way if you're a freelancer. Uh, unless you are totally desperate for the rent, uh, if you say no to any of those, don't take a project. So, uh, I'm aware that this kind of jumps around all over the place. I'm feeling like it jumps around. Maybe you're having a more kind of coherent experience. But um, I think that design is important. And I don't think that uh, the world really recognizes design for what it is and what, what it can be. So that idea that design is how something looks uh, needs to kind of be ditched. So um, for me, design is a process of change. It's, uh, and so a designer can be a change agent, which is a horrible phrase, but uh, one that's kind of common usage. Or a change maker, I don't know which is worse, actually. Um, but I think that the world needs designers. That big slide of big problems, they're all there. They all need solving. And we, as designers, have a role to play in getting the world from this state to one that's better. So we can't afford for good people to be stuck doing bad work. Um, so we need designers to kind of be liberated um, to not be constrained by a specific job title, um, but actually to think that actually part of the role of design is to help us all move forward to a better future. In order for that to be the case, then uh, we need design to be seen as strategically important. So whatever organisation you're working in, whatever project you're working on, then it needs to be uh, considered that design is actually fundamental, not incidental. Uh, and it's not being relegated as being something that's kind of on the back end of something. So uh, Leah Bewley, she's a UX, um, I don't know, 
designer feels, I think consultant, whatever. But anyway, she's uh, just published a study uh, that she's been sort of working on uh, for the last year or so. Uh, and she's, she's asked uh, sort of 266 UX professionals um, to, um, to kind of take part in this survey. And so she's kind of created a, a report off the back of that. And so uh, it kind of gives a picture of the sort of state of UX uh, sort of today. I don't know how uh, representative it is, so uh, I can't sort of do the whole, this is, you know, sort of peer-reviewed and all that sort of thing, but it's worth reading um, uh, on her website and kind of thinking about, well, actually, how does it resonate with you? Uh, does it describe um, uh, the kind of state of UX as you see it? Um, but it's uh, her kind of conclusion from the report is that, um, yes, there's some good signs, but um, that actually UX is, um, is uh, an undeve undevel underdeveloped capability in most organisations, uh, and that is a risk. So what she's saying is that um, this uh, uh, represents a kind of high-impact UX team, UX function, so um, that it sits uh, either in its own department or it sits at kind of like uh, at the, 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 the the higher levels of, uh, of the organization, um, that there's a good ratio of designers to engineers, and um, sort of uh, no more than one to 20, um, that you've got UX leaders at director level and above, so you're kind of represented in the, in, in the bigger conversations about the purpose of the company, um, that customer insight is kind of fundamental to uh, what's made and what's delivered, um, and, uh, and that as a team, you know how to measure and kind of quantify uh, the, the impact of the work that you're doing. Are you telling me to wrap up? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I've got loads more slides. Uh, okay. Um, so, I will move on. But basically, uh, if you're in this kind of team, happy days. Uh, if you're not, then uh, can you change it? Or should you go and visit that website I just mentioned? Um, so, I'm going to whiz through. Uh, I believe that digital uh, is a ring fence. Um, and that uh, we should view it as not really a standalone thing anymore. So I know Richard had a slide that said something was dead, but, uh, so everything's dead. Uh, digital is ubiquitous. So technology mediates everything that we do. Um, so that means that um, our role as designers shouldn't really just sit on a kind of website, but looking at the whole context of, um, of how people are using products and services. Um, and I know that um, Richard's colleague, Andy Budd, published a, a blog post that I read the other day sort of saying, well, the kind of crossover into service design. And again, it's kind of like, why, why do we need the label? But uh, sort of UX and service design needs to kind of work together. Um, so I'm going to whiz through. Um, I believe that everything around us is an interface. So uh, the conversations that we have, the streets that we use, all of that is an interface. Everything that you've learned in the application of UX to an interface online or, you know, whatever media you might, you might have operated in uh, can be applied in external settings. Uh, it's just a great quote, but um, basically uh, it, it's from a guy called uh, Joshua Porter who I've followed since I was a proper UX designer. And uh, I believe that it can be applied in just about every context. So uh, city streets, for instance, I'm interested in cities and towns at the moment, but um, uh, the way that people interact with a street is very much influenced by the furniture of that street. So um, in a, a street where you have multiple doorways and windows, so lots of little buildings, uh, people walk slower and have more interactions, and there is more social cohesion in those uh, streets than where you have big, long stretches of uh, blank wall. And uh, so in those streets, people walk much faster, fewer interactions, much higher incidences of um, antisocial behavior. So actually, there's, a, there's an onus on anyone creating anything uh, to think about the behavior that it creates and to take responsibility for the behavior that is um, kind of created or um, certainly encouraged by what's being designed. Uh, and I believe that that's also the true of, um, of businesses. So when we start a business, um, when tech startups in particular, um, uh, we need to think about, um, I've lost my chain of thought now because I'm trying to speed up, but uh, <laughs> um, yes, so I believe that the, f the, the, the model for tech startups is broken, um, that it's, uh, the, the notion of success as being uh, high investment, high growth and a big sell uh, leads to no value for anyone. 
Um, and that if we think that that's success, then it's not socially beneficial. And I believe that business should be socially beneficial. So um, uh, I was interested to see uh, the, the founder of Vimeo uh, talking at the Do Lectures um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and basically, massive seller's regret. So <laughs> uh, the day after he sold Vimeo, he's thinking like, shit, <laughs> I've lost the thing that made me get up in the morning. Um, and so uh, his, his kind of um, notion now is that you should be building something you don't want to sell. Um, something that you love so much that is so uh, useful and you know that it that it can last for a hundred years. Um, so this is the bit I can speed through, Danny. Uh, so <laughs> uh, this is just a little illustration. But basically, um, a couple of years ago, um, uh, the company I was working in sort of uh, dispersed, and so we uh, we shared out all the assets, and uh, and I was on my own, uh, and I knew I didn't want to work for anyone else, so. Um, but I didn't really know what kind of work I wanted to do because the work I had been doing had been... Um, uh, I, I, I was feeling a, a bit like lost. Uh, um, it hadn't really been doing what I wanted it to do in the world. Um, but I didn't really know where to take myself, so I thought, well, I'll start a business which is really an experiment. Uh, and so Purpose Lab is an experiment. Um, it's uh, an experiment to help me find the work that I find most purposeful. And so I do some consultancy, which I get paid for, and I start my own projects. And um, the projects that I start tend to be um, where my interests are. And so uh, what I try to do is to start something that's interesting to me and then see if I can make it into something I can get paid for. Uh, and I use a little tool. Um, so uh, I created this... Um, uh, I was monstrously busy and had no money, and I was thinking, like, this isn't right. Uh, and so I plotted uh, all my projects on this kind of uh, matrix... Um, what I found was that all the stuff that I was doing was in uh, my hobby pot, and, uh, and that's why I had no money. Uh, and so <laughs> the idea is that uh, you, uh, you just try and use this kind of simple mechanic to look at the work that you're doing, and obviously you want it all to be in the sweet spot. But what I found was that the stuff that was in my hobby pot kind of became my work, and so those are almost like my side projects, which were an indication of what I was interested in and where I could go next. And so uh, some of my hobby projects have actually ended up being in my sweet spot. So that's, that's really good. Uh, here be dragons, avoid that stuff. Like <laughs> Stuff that you don't like and you don't get paid for, don't do it. Um, uh, and my, my pirate pot was particularly problematic. So it was where I felt that I needed to do the work because I needed to do the money. But it didn't pass my, my give a shit test. And so uh, you have to be really careful where you start um, sort of thinking, I need stuff. Uh, because that's where your energy disappears. And then that doesn't leave you any time to do the stuff that will get you the good work. So there's an opportunity cost of, uh, of investing in the pirate pot. Um, I used to call it my prostitute pot, but it didn't feel comfortable, so I changed it to private. <laughs> so uh, I think that's probably my last thing. Um, so uh, I kind of think you should always give some takeaways, but um, uh, I think the world is kind of vukud and that we need designers. Um, and we, design, we need designers to step up to help move the world forward into a positive place. Um, so we need people to be working as free agents and using their full creative potential. Um, we need to be working on stuff that matters, um, that there's too much digital litter out of there, so just shit that's on the cloud somewhere, the apps or whatever that replicate other apps. Or I don't know. Um, I saw something that was pampers that tweet when your baby does a pee or something like that. I don't know. But, uh, it's just, People need to work on stuff that matters, because otherwise, what's the point? And then the other point is to be part of the community, so um, to, to be part of a community of practice, but also of purpose, um, so that uh, we get the benefit of everyone's smartness. Um, uh, that's my bonus slide, and that's that. Thank you very much.